Good. Great. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Xiaogong Wen from MIT, who will tell us today about mathematics of topological order. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Actually, thank you for the invitation. And uh, yesterday, uh, I gave a talk in a similar uh, seminar uh, about uh, the uh, some introduction of a topology order and its relation to the entanglement. And today, I'm going to uh, discuss some mathematical uh, structure of a topology order. Or another way to say that it's a mathematical structure of a many body entanglement, which is a new phenomenon actually. So which require new kind of mathematics to describe the so-called many body quantum entanglement. And uh, so today I will mainly concentrate on try to see the connection between many body entanglement or condensed matter physics and uh, under the mathematics uh, required to describe such a phenomena, which turns out to be the uh, tensor uh, category theory. So how the tensor category theory should be used to describe pattern of a many body entanglement. So that is a, a main issue uh, today. Uh, so, let me see. Okay. So uh, first, uh, uh, let's give a, give a mathematical definition of a, a condensed matter system, a many-body quantum system. And the important thing is that uh, uh, we have a, a Hilbert space for each side. We have a graph. So each vertex has a small Hilbert space, vector space. And the total vector space of a quantum system are given by the tensor product of all those small uh, vector space. Okay, so the tensor product of all those small vector space. And uh, then we have a so-called local operator. The local operator like a OI is the operator acting on the single site, single Hilbert space. And the OIJ are local in a sense, it acts on neighboring uh, uh, Hilbert space. So those define the uh, 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 Hamiltonian Hermitian operator. And, uh, and this Hermitian operator plus this tensor decomposition of the total vector space uh, define a quantum system. And uh, uh, so this, uh, this quantum system is a, uh, uh, is a, is a topic uh, of a study uh, in condensed matter physics. And then uh, uh, in the study of topology order, uh, we pay attention to a particular class of uh, uh, local Hamiltonian. Uh, whose eigenvalue have this kind of a spectrum. Uh, basically, uh, uh, there is an energy gap. There's a big gap uh, in, the, in the spectrum. And the, 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 the energy, uh, this eigenvalue of vector space, uh, eigenvector below the energy gap is called a ground state or ground state subspace. So those are basic concept. And uh, so the, uh, Certainly, the gap of the Hamiltonian is a concept uh, in the limit where n go to infinity, where n is the number of vertex. So when n go to infinity, uh, we kind of imagine that uh, the number of states below that energy gap is not uh, changed. Um, but the number of states above energy gap getting more and more and more and more denser and become continuum. But this, uh, this window of uh, a gap is still there. So this is a so-called gap, the quantum system. Uh, studied in condensed matter physics. And uh, we mainly want to study uh, the angle to infinity limit and want to understand what is the uh, behavior of those uh, uh, low energy or ground state subspace. So this is uh, uh, what we want to study. And for example, uh, uh, we can have a, 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 a vector space on each side. It's a two dimensional vector space. The basis is a spin up, spin down. That's the language we usually use. And uh, then the the Hamiltonian can be very simple. It's the sum of a local operator OI act on each site. And the OI is this poly matrix Z operator, which is for the up is a positive and for, for, for down is a negative eigenvalue. Okay. And naturally, the lowest energy state for this kind of a Hamiltonian is a, it's a state where every spin is up. So this particular uh, state, a uh, product state, it's a it's a eigen states. We kind of draw that so every spins up. That is a many body states, and these states have a special property. It's a product states because it's a tensor product of a, 
of upstate on every side. This tensor product states uh, is kind of like a trivial states. So like a, like a zero in the additive operation or one in the multiplicative operation or the a fusion unit in the tensor category. So the trivial states is a product states. Okay, so that's some kind of basic uh, thing in the condenser matter. And uh, so, so the topologic order is a, is a some, it's a, it's a, it's a really the order in this kind of a gap states. So, so this gap, the subspace, uh, is a, a describe a different a phase of matter. Okay, and there's a topological order really uh, describe this uh, 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 this uh, uh, different phase of matter. And actually, I want to say that uh, here we want to use uh, we have already assumed a equivalence class. That is, uh, if two Hamiltonian uh, which can uh, deform into, into, into each other without closing this energy gap. We say these two Hamiltonian are equivalent. So we have an equivalent class of a Hamiltonian where equivalence relation is that the, the, under deformation, this gap do not close. And uh, under the equivalent class of this Hamiltonian is called a topology order. So there's an issue is that uh, how to uh, characterize, how to describe this uh, topology order. So what is the topological invariance uh, which can characterize the topological order? It turns out that uh, uh, we only need uh, two kinds of topological invariant. The uh, one type of topological invariant is uh, for the so-called ground state degeneracy. Uh, that is uh, the, the number of states uh, below the energy gap where the energy level splitting or eigenvalue splitting is a very small. It's an epsilon go to zero when n go to infinity. So this is a, uh, this is a, 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 a nearly degenerate ground state. And this is ground state degeneracy, somehow if you put this Hamiltonian on, on a space with different topology, okay, then it turns out that uh, this uh, ground state degeneracy depends on the topology of a space. I mean, the, the space is closed with no boundary. Like on the sphere, the degeneracy may be equal to one, on the torus, the degeneracy may be not equal to one. So there is a sequence of the, uh, there is a sequence of uh, integer, which describe this uh, uh, topological uh, degeneracy. And this sequence integer is a, is a topological invariance. So this integer certainly depends on topology of a space and the sequence integer is a topological invariance, which can be used to describe this a gapped state or gapped phase in condenser matter uh, system. Feel free to ask your questions. Uh, uh, you know, you can interrupt me. Uh, just uh, feel free to ask the questions. Okay. And, uh, right yeah. now, um, okay. Asking, yes, is there a connection between many body systems on manifolds you're discussing and QFT on curved space time? If there is, could you talk? Yes, there's a very close relation. So I will, I will mention that uh, later. Yeah. So there's a, almost a direct relation. Okay. So, so actually, I'm describing a QFT, you know, uh, the, the topological quantum field theory, but in the condensed matter language, uh, using the lattice language. So what I'm describing here is really the uh, topological quantum field theory. Okay. And uh, so, so here there's a very important feature is that uh, uh, this kind of degeneracy below the energy gap is robust against any perturbation. You can see, suppose you have a particular Hamiltonian which gave rise to this uh, near, de near degeneracy. Okay. Then the claim is that uh, if you modify the Hamiltonian a little bit, modify those operators a little bit, the degeneracy will not change, will be remain the same. Uh, 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 no, no matter how you modify those operators. And the degeneracy became more and more accurate. This robustness became more and more accurate as n go to infinity. So finally the n, uh, the energy splitting will shift a little bit. But as n go to infinity, uh, this became more and more accurate. Okay, so this is a quite amazing behavior that uh, uh, this pretty arbitrary Hamiltonian on this uh, graph may have a robust degeneracy. And this robustness and accuracy became more and more uh, uh, precise when n go to infinity. Okay. In general, a generic Hamiltonian 
don't have that. Uh, but however, there are certain class of Hantelian have this property. And this property is related to the uh, topological order and uh, related to the topological quantum field theory. And this comes to the conjecture. So which kind of Hamiltonian have this robustness? It turns out that uh, uh, we have a conjecture that uh, uh, if, the, if the ground state degeneracy on the sphere equal to one, then this Hamiltonian are robust. Yeah, this is a, uh, then there's a, uh, there's a robust ground state degeneracy. So this is already a, a quite a amazing uh, a property. Uh, however, if the if the ground state degeneracy on the sphere is not equal to one, then the degeneracy is not robust. So you can add a perturbation to split them. Uh, physically, uh, uh, this property really says that uh, there is no symmetry breaking, and uh, the the degeneracy totally comes from the entanglement uh, and a topological order, uh, which is topic of uh, yesterday's talk. Okay. So this is a, a topological invariance uh, uh, from ground state degeneracy. And, uh, but however, the ground state degeneracy, just a, a sequence of integer, which don't carry too much information. So we cannot use this uh, uh, topological invariance to fully characterize a topological order because there are different topological order with the same sequence of integer. Okay, so we want more data. So one way to obtain more data is to using this uh, notion of modular space, uh, which is the space of a uh, Hamiltonian with energy gap. Okay, and uh, so, but uh, but usually to connect to topological quantum field theory, uh, we define our Hamiltonian uh, using the metric of the space. So we assume a space this M n have a metric, and uh, this uh, the the the, the ter local operator in the Hamiltonian. Uh, uh, define, depend on this metric. We triangulate this uh, a space with a very fine triangulation, and then we using the metric to define our Hamiltonian. So, so therefore, we can think about this, uh, the space of a Hamiltonian is really space of the matrix, which is kind of moduli, Euro moduli space of a manifold. Okay. And also, the, the, the deformorphic equivalent class of a matrix really gave rise to the same uh, uh, equivalent Hamiltonian. So this gave us a notion of a, uh, uh, the moduli space, which is a, a deformorphic equivalent class of a matrix, which is from the moduli space, which we pretend this moduli space is really space of a uh, Hamiltonian. Okay. So once we have this uh, uh, moduli space, then we can define a vector bundle on the moduli space. Uh, because uh, on every point of a moduli space, uh, we have a degenerate subspace, that's a ground state subspace. And uh, this degenerate the ground state subspace is a, a, a vector space. But on a different point of a, a, a modular space, uh, we have a, a, a different vector space. And those vector space are connected if those, uh, uh, if those Hamiltonian belong to the same phase, okay. And so, so therefore, this, uh, they have same dimension and they just uh, twisting around. Uh, when you're changing the uh, a parameter in the Hamiltonian, so therefore this is a uh, uh, so therefore this uh, 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 so this uh, system Hamiltonian system really define a vector bundle on the modular space, and the dimension vector bundle is the ground state degeneracy we just mentioned uh, a moment ago, uh, but the vector bundle certainly contain more information than this uh, uh, degenerate uh, ground state degeneracy. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, so, so this is a uh, Basically, this uh, a vector bundle on the modular space uh, is a full characterization uh, of the uh, of the topological order. So basically, we say that this vector bundle uh, really uh, is a definition define uh, this uh, topological order, or define this uh, many-body entanglement, or if you like, the define the topological quantum field theory. Uh, basically, this is something uh, we want to study. However, uh, for this vector bundle on the on this moduli space, uh, we have this uh, contractible loop. So we, we can consider a contractible loop on the moduli space. And this uh, contractible loop in the moduli space would uh, give you a holonomy, which really gave you, uh, gave you this uh, a UN matrix. N is uh, this uh, degeneracy. 
But however, uh, for the topology order, this vector bound is very special. That's uh, uh, around the contrast loop, this holonomy actually is a purely diagonal U1 phase. This UN, UN matrix is a diagonal, only have a diagonal U1 phase, okay. And this diagonal U1 phase is uh, related to something in physics called the partition function, okay. And this, uh, uh, so this partition function is associated with this uh, contrast loop this uh, or this uh, holonomy of the vector bundle uh, in the, uh, uh, in, around the contrast loop, okay. And for example, uh, for two-dimensional space, if you have this uh, Riemann surface of a genus G, okay, and uh, then we can, we can consider a, a loop in the modular space. And this loop in the modular space would give rise to the space-time, which is a, uh, uh, is roughly is a twist product of a Riemann surface times S1. There could be a twist. So it's a maybe direct product and maybe a twist product. Okay. And then, and then this, uh, this, uh, this U1 phase, this diagonal U1 phase will be related to a partition function on this uh, space time manifold, sigma G times S1, which in, in three dimension, we have a gravitational chain summon term. Okay. So this uh, integration of a gravitational Hellman term on this uh, space-time manifold turns out to be related, directly related to this uh, U1 phase for the contract loop in this uh, uh, fiber bundle, vector bundle. Okay, and this coefficient uh, in the gravitational transformation term is a, a chiral central charge of the two-dimensional topology order. That is another, uh, that is a, a, a another topology invariance. So in addition to ground state degeneracy, uh, we have this uh, chiral central charge, which appear uh, from this uh, uh, diagonal one phase, or appear as a coefficient of a gravitational transformation term. That's another data to characterize a 2D topology order. Okay. And then we can also deform this uh, system around the non contract loop in the moduli space. In this case, the holonomy will contain this uh, U1 phase, which depends on the which path, but they also contain a non-diagonal unitary matrix U. And, uh, and, uh, and this, uh, this, but however, the, the diagonal part is, is path dependent, but the non-diagonal, so up to U1 phase, this unitary U is a, is a universal, okay. So therefore, uh, so this, this kind of non contour loop map the pi one of a modular space uh, to the unitary uh, matrix, uh, SU, uh, to, the, to the U matrix, uh, to the U, uh, this unitary group, okay. And uh, uh, so they form a projective uh, reputation because U and phase is uh, uncertain. So therefore, uh, so this unitary U, a uh, unitary matrix form a projective reputation of a mapping class group because a pi one of a modular space is a mapping class group. So therefore, we also have a mapping class group, uh, which is a third topological environment, uh, which can be used to characterize a topology order. Okay, so, 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 so it is this kind of a, a mapping class group and uh, this central charge really carry the old information. And uh, so we believe that the mapping class group and the central charge completely characterize this topology order of this many body uh, entanglement. But uh, certainly here I want to say that uh, we have to consider mapping class group for all different uh, closed space, not a single one. So all these different topology uh, taken together, this uh, sequence of a mapping class group will, will give us uh, the, the complete characterization of a topology order. So this is uh, one way uh, to describe uh, topology order. Uh, hi, Xiaogang, I, yes. I have a question. So, uh, could, could you uh, give me an example about the modular space? Right now it's like a, a high, very high dimensional space and uh, I have some difficulty to visualize it. And uh, okay, one way to understand the modular space is a falling. And uh, uh, so we can consider, suppose uh, in, in two dimensional space, uh, we have electron in two dimensional space and the electron have a mass. But if there's no rotation symmetry, this mass is a two by two matrix because of the, because the kx squared, ky squared may have different coefficient 
and the kxy may also have a coefficient. So this mass is a two by two matrix. And we can deform this two by two matrix of a mass matrix. And that will be the example of a moduli space. And so basically the, the space of a two by two matrix, actually in a quantum Hall space, you can use this two by two mass matrix as a moduli space. And, uh, and so, so this, uh, 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 actually when you deform the mass matrix, you have a deformed quantum Hall space. And so we can use this mass matrix uh, to, to, to understand the vector bundle and all this uh, notion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks. And uh, yeah, actually, to continue with my question. I, I was trying to understand the modular space from your definition in the last page. So, so first, you we have a Hamiltonian, right? And yeah, this mass matrix is a parameter in the Hamiltonian. So, modular space basically is a parameter, space of a parameter in the Hamiltonian. So the mass oh. matrix is a parameter in the Hamiltonian uh, for the electron in two-dimensional uh, space. Uh, yeah, um, uh, so suppose I have a Hamiltonian which is solvable. So then, then we, uh, uh, usually, they are not, uh, usually they are not solvable. And uh, the, the space of a solvable Hamiltonian is uh, very small. And uh, that probably is not enough. It's too small to, to see this vector bundle. And uh, and the example, actually, that's a very interesting question. Do you have a solvable space of a Hamiltonian, space of a solvable Hamiltonian, which is large enough mm -hmm. to see the non-trivial feature of a vector bundle, which I don't know. Yeah, that would be really interesting. I see. So, so even for string net, that's a question, is it? Uh, for string net, that's a one, just one point. Hmm. And to see this moduli space, we may need to deform a string net to the Hamiltonian, which is not soluble. I see, I see. So most, most Hamiltonian here is not solvable, not exact mm -hmm. solvable, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I have a question here. Yes, okay, yes. Why uh, you call it as a chiral central charge? Because central charge usually defined as a, as a right mover plus left mover. And that's a usual definition of central charge. And here is a central charge of a right mover minus central charge of a left mover. So, okay. so that, yeah, the, defin the central charge is a very general term. Pe people, may use have, people may have a different definition. So I add a chiral to specifically mean the difference of a right mover and the left mover. All right, okay. Yeah. So yeah. for a uh, double uh, topological phase, the usual central charge should be zero, but the yes, chiral yes. central charge is non-zero. Yeah, is for this quantum right? Hall states, yeah, for quantum Hall state, they are non-zero. But uh, for, for the quantum double or gate theory, the central charge all equal to zero. So there is oh. no, there's no transaction term. Okay, all right, thank you. So this is very interesting. For this double the theory, uh, there, this vector bundle is, can be made exactly flat. There is no U1 connection. It's a, it's a, it's a, this vector bundle is a equivalent to a flat bundle. Okay. But however, the chiral central charge means that there's abstraction to make this vector bundle into flat bundle. So there's a U1 connection, U1 curvature. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sorry, can I ask you a question? Uh, yeah, so sure. since you use the central charge as a definition of this topological order, so uh, does it is it limited to two plus one dimension or can it be mm, three plus no, one? No, it's or? A, it's got any dimension. But uh, but this there's a very interesting thing. Actually, this as a u one this u one phase can appear in any dimension. Okay, in principle, but somehow in two plus one dimension we have a, a u one curvature, non trivial curvature, which is a, a non trivial u one bundle. Okay. Uh, in three plus one dimension, we believe this vector bundle have uh, no non-trivial U1 curvature. So it means all the chain number equal to zero. So you can, you can deform this vector bundle into flat bundle, okay, in three dimension. In four plus one dimension, we believe that's also true. But the, the next example is uh, maybe seven plus one dimension. In a seven plus one dimension, this U1 bundle can have non-trivial curvature. Yeah. So, so, yeah, those are mystery. Uh, we don't have a proof right now. It's, that's, that's intuition from physics. Yeah. That's, uh, the, the gravitational term only appear in a four dimension, eight dimension of space time. 
there is no gravitational transatomic term in other dimension. That's implied uh, this, uh, this, this U1 bundle is a uh, trivial as a U1 bundle. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So it's, uh, it's quite mysterious. So why, why is it flat? Uh, we, don't not, we don't know. So all those are uh, questions, questions and, uh, for TKFT. And uh, hopefully we can find a more rigorous mathematical uh, derivation. So those are relation to the TKFT. So what I'm talking about really is the TKFT in some sense. Uh, in the TKFT, we associate uh, the like n plus one dimensional closed manifold with a number. So this manifold is a uh, space time. And this number is uh, really the particular function we just uh, talked about in physics. Okay. And then we associate the n dimension manifold, which is one lower dimension, uh, with a vector space. And this vector space is exactly the degenerate ground state subspace. It's a ground state subspace we just uh, uh, talked about a moment ago. So that is uh, for, the, for the closed manifold, for the closed space manifold. And we have a degenerate ground state subspace, uh, which is a vector space in the topological quantum field theory. And then if, the, if this manifold, n dimensional manifold is a boundary for space time, n plus one dimensional space time, then this, uh, then this uh, structure associated with a particular vector in the vector space. And uh, physically, that means that uh, we have uh, this uh, n plus one dimensional space time is uh, evolution. This uh, space time evolution uh, gave rise to a particular uh, state on the space, on the bound which is a boundary. And so the, and this particular uh, state must be a ground state, one of the ground state in this uh, degenerate subspace, so that's a vector. Uh, in the in this vector space, so from here we can see that uh, this topology order and the TKFT are really the almost identical, but there's a slightly a slight, slight difference. In the topology order, we have an additional requirement that uh, as I mentioned, the ground state dependency on the sphere must be equal to one, and that is stability. If this is not equal to one, it's not stable. It's not topological from a condensed matter point of view. But however, I think in mathematics. Uh, the TKFT may be more general, may allow this uh, uh, to be bigger than one, okay, uh, which I don't know. Uh, I think that assuming this uh, vector space to be one, one dimension in the sphere uh, is also very natural. And here I want to say that uh, in, from a condensed matter point of view, uh, we think this uh, natural choice is uh, it's kind of physically motivated. And so therefore, the set of topology order really corresponds to the special kind of TKFT, where the dimension vector space on sphere always equal to one. It's a one-dimensional vector space on sphere. And that is a stability uh, conjecture. Okay, so, so as a result, we see that actually the, the moduli space uh, for, the, for the in one dimension, the moduli space is trivial. Uh, basically, that's a loop space of uh, S1, and uh, but uh, with uh, only the winding number is uh, one, okay. So uh, such a loop space is, uh, is really trivial. Pi one of this loop space uh, of modular space is trivial, so there's no mapping class group. And also, the pi n of this, uh, uh, of this uh, modular space is also trivial, so that means uh, there's no U1 uh, vector bundle. The U, even U1 curvature part is uh, trivial. So this vector bundle is completely trivial. So according to our conjecture, if you believe this vector bundle fully characterized topology order, then we say that uh, there is no uh, topology order uh, in one plus one dimension. So, so therefore, there is only trivial topology order. There is no non-trivial topology order uh, in one plus one dimension, if there is no symmetry. Certainly with the symmetry, things are different, you know, which we will not discuss here. And, but however, in mathematics, there's a lot of study on the two-dimensional, two-dimensional two space-time, uh, TKFT. So we believe that all this uh, uh, 2D TKFT will have a degeneracy on this, will have vector space uh, on, 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 the, on the circle, which is uh, have a dimension larger than one, okay. So th those are, those are uh, so in condensed matter, those 2D TKFT are unstable TKFT. But it's still interesting mathematically, uh, just uh, physically. So it's interesting, those interesting mathematical 2D TKFT correspond to what kind of physics is not very clear. So that's a, very, another very interesting uh, open question. 
Okay, so now let's consider a two-dimensional uh, space. Two dimension is the more interesting. And uh, the moduli space for the two-dimensional Riemann surface uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is quite non-trivial. And uh, so therefore we have a non-trivial uh, vector bundle on the, on the moduli space of a, a Riemann surface, okay. And the, the dimension of a vector is really the uh, one state of degeneracy. Uh, for sphere is equal to one, so that's just a line bundle. For the, for the, for the torus or genetic true Riemann surface, in general, the degeneracy is not equal to one, so we have a quite a non-trivial uh, vector bundle. Okay. And, uh, and because in two plus one dimension, we have a gravitational transformation term. Uh, so therefore, uh, uh, so therefore this, uh, the diagonal part, the U1 part of the determined, determined bundle of this vector bundle is non-trivial, uh, have a non-trivial uh, chain number. And, uh, and so, uh, which correspond to the chiral central charge as I just uh, mentioned, okay. And, uh, and this chiral central charge can be measured physically, which correspond to quantize the Hall conductance. The chiral central charge is really a Hall conductance, uh, which can be measured experimentally. Actually, uh, there are experiments which measure this uh, chiral central charge using this uh, thermal Hall conductance. Okay. Then if, uh, if, uh, if a genius uh, is a two, one, then we have uh, this, uh, uh, the, the pi one of this uh, uh, moduli space. It's actually, is this, uh, 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 this SL2Z, this uh, moduli group, okay. And uh, so, uh, so, so we can, uh, this moduli group is generated by 90 degree rotation. For example, we can deform this uh, torus with this uh, uh, tall rectangular to a short rectangular. And then uh, these two rectangular differ by the uh, deformorphism, this uh, XY exchange 90 degree rotation deformorphism. Okay. And so that is called the S matrix. And uh, there's a dying twist. We can, we can shear uh, deform this uh, torus from a square to something uh, sheared uh, a parallelogram. But this, uh, she this particular sheared parallelogram and the square oh, again differ by uh, a coordinate transformation. And so that is, uh, that's give us another uh, 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 pi one. And this is uh, give us a T matrix. And this S and T generate this modular group SL2Z. So S and T have this uh, a relation. Okay, I, re I remember, I mentioned, I mentioned that uh, we should get this uh, uh, project representation. But this project representation can be fixed by including this uh, actual uh, UN factor dependent on chiral central charge. And uh, actually we can get some kind of uh, rep regular reputation. And, uh, but anyway, so this is a, uh, uh, this is a ST matrix and give rise to this uh, reputation for moduli group. And uh, this data is S, T and C uh, may characterize this uh, 2D topological order. But however, this data is, is not really uh, complete. So, uh, uh, for simple topology order, this data is complete. But in general, they are not complete. So basically really say that there are different topology order, there are different TKFT, which have the same S, T, and C. And uh, so there's counter examples. And it turns out that uh, uh, if you have considered mapping class representation of genius to Riemann surface, then we can distinguish those uh, counter examples, okay. So, so therefore, the mapping class group reputation of a higher genius Riemann surface are needed. But we don't know to which genius we are needed. Maybe genius two is enough. We don't need to consider genius three. Or maybe two and three is enough. Uh, we don't need, do not need to consider genius four and beyond. And that looks like a more likely situation because uh, the higher genius uh, mapping class group and the lower genius have some simple relations. It uh, looks like this, uh, one, two, three uh, uh, may, may cover all the complexities. So maybe that's three is enough. So again, this is an open question. Uh, what kind of mapping class reputation which can uh, give rise to this, uh, uh, all this topology order? Okay. And uh, okay, so those are really the, the setup in terms of a, a ground state uh, a subspace or in terms of a, a vector bundle. Uh, how to characterize or how to define topology order or physically or mathematically, okay. And within this setup, and we find uh, some interesting relation. 
that is a chiral central charge. Uh, that's one of the topological invariants. And the ground state degeneracy on the close Riemann surface, Gina C Riemann surface. Uh, there's a relation. Actually, this relation is a pretty uh, simple relation. And uh, that's a, this a product of a, this a chiral central charge, usually it's a rational number. And this rational number cannot be too complex. <laughs> okay. And if a ground state degeneracy is uh, very small, and the central charge should be very should have very simple denominator, small denominator. <laughs> okay, and uh, uh, so have this relation, and uh, and this relation uh, can be obtained via some kind of algebraic topological uh, thinking. Okay, I will not really go into the detail, uh, but this, those are really a uh, uh, point to a direction is that uh, those are data of a mapping class group central charge, they should satisfy certain conditions, something like that. And if you find all those conditions, then we probably can have a classification in terms of those data. So unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, we don't know too many conditions from this point of view. Uh, so therefore, uh, 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 we have very little progress uh, just uh, using this, uh, uh, con this, uh, this uh, mapping class group uh, and the condition on the mapping class group. And uh, from this direction, uh, to formulate a complete theory of a topological order. So there are some uh, open questions uh, here. Okay, so, uh, so as I mentioned that uh, we have a issue. This, uh, uh, for every topological order, we have this data S, T, and C. But however, uh, however this relation is not one to one. Uh, there can be several topological order or several TQFT which give rise to the same STC, okay. And uh, so there's another thing that uh, if you have an arbitrary uh, ST from a moduli, from, from a representation of a moduli group, then this ST may not correspond to any topological order. So only some special representation of a moduli group correspond to topological order. So there's a, again, there's a question, which reputation for moduli group correspond to topological order, which do not correspond to topological order? So those are kind of open questions we don't know, okay. And uh, if you can find all the conditions, then we have a classification, but uh, we don't know. However, there's an idea, okay, and uh, uh, there's some idea uh, we can uh, uh, find a condition of this uh, SNT matrix uh, by consider excitations, okay. So one motivation for this is that, uh, let's consider torus. The torus can be viewed as a sphere with a handle. And we can make this handle very, very thin. Then that led to the a sphere with a puncture connected by a line, okay. <laughs> so basically, uh, so this torus can be viewed as a punctured sphere connecting by something. Okay, and uh, so, so therefore, so this motivates, motivates us to consider the, the Riemann surface with the punctures and the moduli space of Riemann surface with the punctures. And that may give us a more data, more general point of view. But once we have a punctures, maybe we don't need topology. We can consider sphere with the punctures, okay. And a sphere with a puncture and the moduli space of a sphere with the punctures. And there's a vector bundle on that moduli space. And that moduli space, I think, actually corresponds to another topic in my analysis, is so a unitary modular tensor category. So those are those kind of vector space on the puncture sphere uh, really correspond to the property of a topological excitation uh, in physics. Okay. So so now we, we go into uh, to that. So actually, so that's led to this uh, 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 conjecture that uh, the the uh, this topological order uh, are classified by this uh, 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 module tensor category, and historically this connection is a uh, is a little bit uh, uh, kind of like, like some discussed in some detour. So the Witten uh, in this paper they define the topological quantum field theory and they find their connection with the conformal field theory, and the more and the cyber have the very systematic study of conformal field theory and they find the final connection of a module tensor category. So, so from, from this point of view, you can see that uh, there is a, a rather close connection between topological quantum field theory and the modular uh, tensor uh, category. 
uh, in in two dimension. Okay, so so therefore this uh, uh, uh but however uh, from condensometric point of view, this module tensor category actually is a theory for the excitations. So for this point defect uh, on the sphere. Okay, so therefore right now uh, in condensometric. Uh, we, we, we have a great interest in the category theory because those category theory actually is the theory uh, to describe uh, uh, excitations. Okay, so in the following, I will try to describe uh, uh, in, in general way. So what is the excitation uh, in condensed matter? How the excitation in condensed matter are connected uh, to the uh, modular tensor category? Thanks, Xiao Gang, I have a question. Yes. Uh, for CFT, so go, go, going from CFT to modular tensor category, uh, and uh, at uh, near Anion's, there is a, a unitary modular tensor category. So, do you have a simple understanding of why uh, the unitary constraint come from? Uh, because you, I think because the physics is unitary, uh, in the sense that the Hilbert space have a positive uh, norm, and mm -hmm. the Hamiltonian or Hermitian operator. So, so, th so therefore, this uh, uh, so th those uh, define the uh, unitarity uh, condition, and uh, certainly the non-unitary uh, module tensor category, and uh, also have a very rich mathematical structure, very beautiful mathematical structure. And at the moment, I don't know uh, whether those non-unitary theory from mathematics have a correspondence uh, in physics. Right now, it's not very clear. Yeah, but that's again, that's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And so what is a topological excitation? The topological excitation basically is something can be trapped. So let's consider a Hamiltonian, which is sum of local operators, okay. And uh, so that's uh, this Hamiltonian, this H0, define the ground state subspace, okay. And then we modify the Hamiltonian, we modify some of those local operators, and that define the trap, okay. And uh, so we have a new Hamiltonian. So based on Hamiltonian with a local modification. That's a, that's a new Hamiltonian. And this new Hamiltonian uh, also have a gap, the ground state. So they all have, also have this energy gap. There is something degenerate space, degenerate state below the energy gap. Okay, we consider this kind of a, a new Hamiltonian. Okay, and this, uh, this uh, degenerate subspace of a modified Hamiltonian uh, will be called this, uh, uh, this V ground. Okay, they depend on this uh, KC1, KC2, that's the location of this uh, uh, traps. Okay, so from here, that's it. So that is, uh, that is an excitation uh, because this uh, ground subspace is different. So that's different from, the, from H0. So that's something different, that's an excitation. And from here, we can see that the so-called excitation are labeled by the trap Hamiltonian. This is delta H. Just label different excitation. That's a very general way to say excitation. But certainly, there's an infinite number of delta H that's too complicated. And we want to have an equivalence relation. These are topological excitation are equivalent, equivalent class of the excitations. So what is the equivalence relation? The equivalence relation is that the two trap Hamiltonian delta H and delta H tilt are equivalent if they can deform into each other without closing this energy gap. If you can find a deformation path without closing energy gap, which connecting these two Hamiltonian, then we say these two excitation are equivalent. Okay. And this equivalence class are really uh, uh, excitation. And they correspond to object in the category theory. So the object in category theory is really this equivalent class of delta H, okay. And there is a simple object, we call the simple type. This simple type of excitation is that uh, this excitation, when you perturb the Hamiltonian near this excitation, the ground state subspace remain degenerate. They do not split, they're stable. So in physics, usually when we say excitation, we only mean this simple type. But however, in this definition, we also allow this composite type. This composite type excitation correspond to the unstable excitation with accidental degeneracy. This accidental degeneracy means that if you deform the trap, uh, this, uh, this degeneracy will be split. Okay, 
And that's the composite object. So you can see that in physics, when we define excitations, we naturally have a simple object and the composite object in mathematics. So this, uh, we start to see the feature of a category theory. So in the composite object, it's really defined as a direct sum. So like this alpha, if they can split into I and a J, so that's what we say this alpha type is composite, is a direct sum of I type and a J type. So that's a definition of a J. Any question? I'm sorry, a question. Yeah, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. As maybe I ask quickly. So uh, even if you fuse these excitations together, would that be the same equivalence class? Okay. Yeah. So so let me uh uh let me post on this uh, just a few minutes. I will talk about that fusion right okay. now. Uh, but here I want to say that uh, there is also trivial type, which is fusion unit, uh, the trivial type. The trivial type correspond to the excitation, which can be created by local operator. You can see that. Uh, when you have a trap, we have a new ground state. But the new ground state and the old ground state, they may not differ by the local operator. Although our trap are local, but the wave function may not differ locally. But however, if a wave function do low differ locally, then we say this trap defines the trivial type. The trivial type really means that uh, this trap Hamiltonian only modifies the wave function locally. There is no global modification. And so we have a trivial type means the local, uh, the excitation, excitation can be created by local operator. Uh, so and, question. Yes. So, so by, by adding excitation, we change the homotonium by some local terms. So those local terms are not at the to tuning of the homotonium, right? So it, it changes from, from it changes, uh, it's not within the moduli space. It's like it, it's a, uh, in some sense, yes, uh, because uh, when you're adding this, uh, when you're adding this uh, delta H uh, mm -hmm. to, to H0, uh, when you're turning on delta H, we make close energy gap. Mm -hmm. And reopen, you get a new set of ground state. I see. Yeah, because H0 have a set of ground state. When you, when you slowly turn on delta H, you know, the energy gap may close, then open again, then you get the a different set of ground states. <clears throat> and uh, so, so when delta H is large, uh, you may get a different uh, excitation. We don't assume delta H is small. Mm -hmm. Delta H can be very large, but they are local, only non-zero yes. near one point. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and for not, not many anions, in general, the space, the ground state degeneracy change, changes. So in that context, I can see it's necessary that we, we it's a large change. We need to close the gap. Yeah, yeah. About our for billion, not, for our billion anion, for abelian anion, this degeneracy, ground state degeneracy is always one dimensional. Mm -hmm. For non abelian anion, they can be, they can be multi dimension. Okay. okay, so so for abelian anions, do you expect this to be still uh, some non trivial mapping? I mean, is it, can it be some finite type circuit or not? No. And uh, for, for abelian anion, oh, that's a, that's a very good question. Actually, no. Uh, if you fix the location of the uh, abelian, okay, if, if two abelian anions are very far apart, mm -hmm. uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, this is a tricky question. Uh, I see. Okay, okay, yeah. I, I think uh, this is a very good question. I think uh, uh, you're right. Uh, for, for abelian anions, and uh, the space with the, the state with the abelian anions probably is connected to the ground states via finite types of quantum circuit. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, and uh, so, so this is a, a for Abin Anyang, this is a special property of Abin Anyang, yes. Oh, I see, thank you. Sorry, but, a follow up question. Yeah, I don't know any proof about that. Yeah. But it's kind of tricky. Sorry, oh, a follow up please. question. Yeah. Yes. You, you said delta H can be a large and it can close the gap. Is that would be a boundary critical phenomenon? Like the point that it closes uh, the not gap. H, or in the delta H. When delta, delta H, H can be large, when you add the delta H, uh, they close gap and they, they create a non trivial excitation. If a delta H do not do not close gap, then delta H just deformation of the ground of H zero. Then it's just a trivial trivial excitation. So is that but a boundary H critical the boundary yeah, is, but, but, actually, I, we, we not we have not talked about the boundary. You are totally right. When the Hamiltonian have a boundary 
there's another physics. The boundary also is highly non-trivial. Right now, I only talk about the closed space time, closed space uh, to okay. avoid the boundary. Uh, but certainly you can add a boundary. There's a yet another uh, 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 direction. Uh, so very rich. Okay. And here is a is a answer to your question. This uh, this uh, uh, this uh, fusion. So suppose we have a two x station uh, at a two simple uh, x station i and j, and uh, they are kind of close, and we can view this uh, pair of i j. We can view them together as a single x station. Okay, and this defines the notion of fusion. Basically, when you bring IJ close, and they may they may be became a third extension. So in, in, in physics, we say, okay, when you combine, when you have a bouncy two particles, you get a third particle. But in mathematics, the things became more non-trivial because this third particle may not be simple, may not be stable, may be composite, means that a, it may be direct sum or maybe accidental degeneracy of several other simple types, okay. And for example, if you bring IJ together, these degenerate ground states can split when they're too close. And this, this from two group became a type K1 and type K2. Um, K1, K2 are simple type, a stable type. Okay, so that means that uh, the fusion of a two particle have a direct sum. So this is a possibility, uh, 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 point out by mathematicians. So we should consider this direct sum. Uh, in physics, we usually ignore this possibility. <laughs> and so there's a fusion is more complicated. We have this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, structure. Okay. And uh, so, uh, so actually this, this not notion is uh, also familiar to physics in some way. We, saw, we know the spin on half, uh, uh, bound state uh, fusion of spin on half and spin on half gives spin zero and spin one. So we, we do have direct sum. But for, for non-abelian particle, this is a very general. And so this matrix H, N, A, N, I, J, K is a fusion matrix satisfy some associativity condition like a fusion I, J first and fusion J, K first give us same result. So this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, fusion uh, uh, coefficient uh, satisfies some kind of uh, uh, consistency uh, relation. And this is uh, not, uh, this is not uh, all and uh, uh, so actually, uh, from this uh, fusion matrix, uh, uh, so from fusion coefficient, we can define the notion of a quantum uh, dimension. Okay. So here, we fix the location of excitation. And uh, excitation all have a fixed location. We ask, what is the internal degree freedom? Well, the internal degree freedom of those uh, uh, of excitation, uh, basically, is the degeneracy of this uh, space, of this uh, ground ground state subspace. And that's correspond to uh, the, uh, uh, the, the internal degree freedom because their position already fixed. The trap has a fixed location. So then the degeneracy must correspond to internal degree freedom. So therefore this dimension of this, uh, 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 this vector space with, uh, with the traps should correspond to the product of the internal degree freedom. And from here, we can compute the internal degree freedom. For example, when you have an excitation I, so this type of I excitation, and we can consider the fusion of many, many N of a, a I excitation, type of I excitation. And the, the dimension of fusion space, we are taking the Nth root, give us a number, and this number should correspond to internal degree freedom, which you call quantum dimension. So this really try to view this, uh, review this, uh, the fusion space, this a fusion of uh, this uh, uh, I type excitation, this grounded subspace as a tensor product of uh, some small vector space associated, associated with each particle. And if this relation is valid, valid, then certainly the dimension defined this way will be the dimension of this individual uh, small vector space. And uh, actually uh, this, uh, uh, this dimension can be computed by that consider fusion of uh, these uh, uh, I particles, this, uh, this type I particle, we just count how many trivial particles it may produce, okay. The number of a type of a trivial, this uh, degeneracy of a trivial particle basically means the degeneracy of ground states. So this coefficient in front of this uh, trivial particle is this degeneracy. So once we know the fusion rule, we can compute that. And we can compute this uh, quantum dimension. 
What is amazing is that uh, the quantum dimension in general is in general, this is general, <laughs> non-integer, <laughs> okay. And uh, so, uh, so it's kind of amazing that uh, uh, the, even the degree freedom uh, can be non-integer, or the vector, spa vector space can be fractionalized. And this really is the situation for non-abelian excitation. So therefore, for non-abelian excitation, we have this fractionalized the vector space. Okay. And uh, but however, uh, to describe a fusion, there is a more more data. It's called the F symbol, which really corresponds to CJ symbol because when you're fusing this uh, uh, IJK into some particle L, there's many many multiple of L. But however, uh, the basis of uh, this uh, several L together uh, is uh, is ambiguous, and the fusing IJ first and the fusing JK first led to different uh, bases in this uh, uh, direct sum subspace. And these different bases are related by the unitary matrix, uh, which is F symbol. And we are, uh, we are familiar with this kind of changing basis in the, in the group representation, which is a CJ symbol. So F symbol basically is a sim similar thing. So this, uh, this F symbol and this NIJK is a data which define the so-called unitary uh, fusion category. Uh, the fusion is unitary because this F symbol is a is a is a this changing basis is, is a unitary transformation, and a certain F symbol also satisfies this uh, famous quantum identity, and the solution of quantum identity gave us a, a valid uh, fusion. So this is a uh, uh, this is basically the story of a, of a, of a unitary uh, fusion uh, category. Okay, and this uh, unitary fusion category. What is the physics? The physics is that it's a theory to describe one dimensional excitation. Because in one dimension, we can only fuse particles. We cannot break. So in one dimension, we will have a fusion operation. So if you only want to consider fusion of one dimensional particles, the most you can get is a fusion category. So the fusion category is a, is a full data to describe all possible fusion, all possible consistent fusion of a one-dimensional excitation. Okay. And uh, so let me, let me skip this. And uh, so, so this unitary fusion category classify the one-dimensional excitations. Do they classify one-dimensional topology order? You know, we have a lot of non-trivial fusion category, but we mentioned that there's no one dimensional topology order, only trivial one. There's no non trivial one. So there's a mismatch here. So there's some uh, uh, puzzle here. So it turns out that uh, uh, even though we have a many non trivial fusion category, but however, all those non trivial fusion category have uh, no physics correspondence. It means that uh, we don't have any one dimensional uh, system whose excitation can realize on this uh, 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 unitary fusion category. Okay, so we have a, a very, very sophisticated theory, but for nothing, because uh, all of them are not realizable physically. In physics, we only realize a trivial fusion category. Okay, so this obstruction to find a lattice realization is called anomaly. So that's uh, another way to define anomaly, rather than from this uh, 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 non-invariance of a deformorphism. And uh, so, so therefore, in this, using this language, we say that uh, the unitary fusion category theory is a consistent theory, but however, it have anomaly, means it have no lattice realization. So it's, it is anomalous uh, theory. Only trivial fusion category is anomaly free. <laughs> All other non-trivial fusion category is, uh, uh, is, not, is anomalous, okay. Okay. So, so then there is, a, uh, there is an issue is that uh, suppose you give a, a category theory, which it describe a consistent uh, uh, fusion uh, and the, like a braiding of extension. And uh, it's possible this category theory is not realizable, it's anomalous. So how do you tell whether a certain theory uh, for extension is anomalous or not? Okay. So one way to tell is that uh, there is a principle of uh, remotely detectability, okay? And uh, so if uh, every particle 
if every non-trivial particle can be remotely detected by some other particle, then we say this is anomaly free. Okay. So one example is that in two dimension, so we have a first particle, if the braiding of a second particle around the first particle, far away from first particle, gave rise to some non-trivial phase, then that's, that's an example of remote detection. Okay. If every particle can be remotely detected by some other particle except the trivial particle, then, then this kind of a theory is uh, anomaly free and it's realizable. Okay, so, so from the, uh, so in one dimension, we see that in one dimension, we cannot do this braiding. So there's no non-trivial uh, remote, uh, uh, remote operation we can perform. So therefore, that's why the, uh, all the non-trivial unitary fusion category are anomalous, because uh, we, there's simply no room to do re remote operation. <laughs> And uh, so, so therefore, they had to be, uh, they had to be uh, not realizable. Okay. And uh, okay. So, uh, so actually, you know, now I come back. So here, let's say that uh, although the unitary fusion category series is consistent, but it does not exist because not realizable. So that seems uh, against our philosophy. Is that uh, so? Uh, so actually, if if it is consistent, it must exist. But uh, there exists in another form. Okay. Although this uh, unitary fusion category cannot be realized as a one-dimensional uh, system. And uh, however, we believe that it's conjecture. They can always realize uh, as a boundary of the uh, of the two-dimensional. Uh, uh, lattice model, okay. So there, there exists a two-dimensional lattice model whose boundary have a boundary ex excitation. And those boundary excitation realize all the possible uh, unitary fusion category, okay. So every fusion category theory can be realized as a boundary of a two-dimensional lattice model, okay. And so, so we have this correspondence that is uh, the, if a 1D model is anomaly free, if something can be realized by one dimension, we don't need a two dimension. Or another way to say that the two dimension is a product state, it's a trivial topology order. So the so anomaly free a one dimensional theory corresponds to trivial two dimensional topology order. However, if the one D theory have a non trivial anomaly, if a unitary fusion category have a non trivial anomaly, means that it corresponds to a non trivial two dimensional topology order. Okay. So it's really related to the uh, following uh, notion. Actually, the anomaly really is a one-to-one -one correspond to the topology order in one higher dimension. So this really led to the classification of anomaly. It's just a topology order in one higher dimension. And uh, uh, so that's a new uh, modern understanding of a uh, uh, topology order. Okay, I think I will finish in five minutes. I, I'm sorry, I, I'm kind of over. So, so this really led to the uh, uh, theory for two-dimensional excitation. So in two dimension, in two dimension, we allow exchange, we allow braiding. So we can the particle I can go around particle J. So this uh, braiding gave us uh, this uh, R R symbol. Just uh, this relation between the fusion of I J and the fusion of J I also related by the unitary matrix of changing basis, and that's R symbol. And this R symbol and F symbol are related, have some relation, self-consistent relation, this kind of hexagon identity. And then this, uh, in addition, so we have N, F, R, they all together, once you add in this R symbol, that's defined so-called the braided fusion category, okay. So this is supposed to be a theory for two-dimensional topology order, okay. And this is a much richer, and this uh, mathematically, this studied uh, more. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, a lot of study in this. But uh, certainly, we would ask a question: whether the two-dimensional, this braided fusion category, classified two D topology or not? And the answer is no. The reason is uh, is similar, uh, because uh, this uh, uh, this braided fusion category describe a consistent fusion, a braiding the fusion. But maybe they are not realizable, and they may be anomalous. 
So we so only a normally free uh, uh, bridge fusion category correspond to topological order. So we need we need to find anomaly free uh, bridge fusion, and this anomaly free uh, bridge diffusion category uh, is realizable. But anomaly free really means that uh, the, the the double braiding is non-trivial, and the double braiding in the bridge diffusion category is described by the the centralizer. Means that uh, uh, the centralizer is a set of uh, excitation which have a trivial braiding with every other excitation. So that's a called the centralizer or the Mugra center. So therefore, in order for the braid diffusion category to be anomaly free, it's a Mugra center should contain only trivial excitation. So only trivial excitation uh, have a trivial braiding with everything else. And uh, so this is really defined the so-called non-degenerated braid diffusion category, it means that the Mugra center is a trivial. And uh, so the, the non-degenerated braid diffusion category is uh, this uh, realizable uh, lattice model, which is a modular tensor category theory. Okay. And uh, so then we ask uh, whether modular tensor category theory classify topology order or not. The answer is also no. <laughs> They're missing a little bit. Actually, there's, a, there's one type of topology order, and which is, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, so-called invertible, means that uh, uh, you know, we are stacking two topological, to, topological order together, uh, we get a third topological order. If the, if, this, uh, if the third topological order happens to be trivial, then we say the B is the inverse of A, or A is the inverse of V, if a C is a product state. And uh, so that defines the invertible topological order. The invertible topological order have a property that it has no non-trivial topological excitation. So if you look at the excitation of invertible topological order, they are non-trivial. But however, non, sorry, invertible topological order is non-trivial. But their excitation are always trivial. Okay. And they are, so this invertible topological order only non-trivial in their boundary states. We do not talk about the boundary, so we don't see their non-trivialness. Okay, so therefore, this module tensor category only classify the topology order up to this invertible topology order. And uh, we have invertible topology order is uh, related to this uh, cobaltism, this uh, orientable cobaltism. And uh, so therefore, so we know them pretty well. So like in different dimension, uh, in three, in two plus one dimension, uh, the invertible topology order classify Z, and in four plus one is Z two, six plus one is Z and Z. Okay, so we know them pretty well. So up to those invertible topology order, order this a module tensor category theory really classify the two dimensional topology order. Okay, and uh, so. Uh, I have a question, Xiaohuang. Yes. The, uh, yeah, a question about new invertible topology order. So. Uh, yeah, so the bulk excitation of invertible topological order is uh, trivial, and we can see the effect on the boundary. And uh, my question is, uh, uh, do you expect that we can see whether the the topological order, invertible topological order is non-trivial by looking at the bulk, let's see, for example, looking at the wave function of the, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so, yes, uh, this uh, invertible topological order, the wave function, is not connect to product states via this a uh, local unitary transformation. Mm -hmm. So, so that that's that's uh, by defined de definition of topology using this equivalent class of a, a quantum a finite type quantum circuit. And uh, so, 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 so there are exists a non-trivial equivalent class mm -hmm. where whose extension is a uh, 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 trivial. <laughs> okay. So, so right now we have a two way to describe topology. One is in terms of ground states, this ST matrix. Another is in terms of excitation, like this fusion F and R. Okay. And it turns out that these two descriptions are related. For example, there is a well known Volandi formula, and which is related to this uh, uh, related N and S together. So, therefore, we have a lot of uh, relation, a consistent condition from this uh, particle point of view, from an excitation point of view. And uh, because these two are related, and uh, so those condition on this, uh, on this uh, particle can be translated into condition on ST. So at the end, we, find, we believe we find a complete 
condition on ST matrix. So solving those conditions on ST matrix, we can obtain uh, all the possible ST matrix which correspond to topological order. Certainly each ST matrix may correspond to several topological order, but uh, we can indeed find uh, the condition on ST matrix, they actually do correspond to a, a non-trivial topological order, okay? So we believe we, we have that a, a condition. So this is really kind of program of a modular data. And the, the valid modular data would correspond to a valid topological order. It could be multiple one, okay. And from here, uh, we can list the topological order using ST matrix. But that's still hard to, 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 to write down. So T, we can diagonalize T. So T is eigenvalue of T. Is this is called the topological spin. And the first row for S matrix is actually the quantum dimension. So this we can see. The quantum dimension is the first row of S matrix. So this allows us just to list the quantum dimension and the topological spin and, uh, and the listing all these uh, 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 legal S and T matrix and to get a partial classification of a topological order. I think I, would, I should stop here. Yeah, I, I go slower than I expected and uh, so, so drag the longer. So this is a wonderful program. Uh, try to find a list of topological order and, uh, uh, and uh, then using this uh, tensor category theory or using module data and et cetera. And uh, certainly in two dimension, we have a pretty good story. In higher dimension, we really know very little. Yeah, that's a, another open direction. Yeah, I should really stop here, yeah. Thank you so much for that great talk. Um, so any questions for Xiao Gan? I must warn before, before we have any questions. Um, unfortunately, I have a commitment in a few minutes and this is since this is my Zoom meeting, unfortunately, uh, I have to end it in a few minutes. So um, maybe some quick questions and after that, um, we can try to find another way to ask Xiao Gan your questions. I have a question about the uh, usage of uh, uh, category theory in complex matter physics uh, in topological order. Uh, one way is that we're talking about the fusion category of uh, uh, all possible uh, excitations uh, in a topological yeah. order. Yes. Another one is the starting uh, fusion category for the level one model. The okay. two are different. The first one in level one model yeah, this will be the quantum different. double. So yes. Yes. here you are talking about the quantum double, right? Not the starting. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. So uh, so actually in the, in the level one model or string line model, uh, it's a construction of a wave function using data of a spherical fusion category. Okay. And uh, so at the beginning, it's just a trick. We somehow write down a many body wave function using data of a fusion category and obtain a two dimensional topological order. It turns out that uh, this trick has a physical meaning. That is, uh, the boundary of this two dimensional topological order happen to be described by their extension happen to be described by this uh, fusion category we used to construct the 2D wave function. And uh, so therefore, and this is actually general. Suppose you have a topological order, you know their boundary have a described by a few certain fusion category. Then there exists a construction to using this fusion category to construct a, a, a 2D wave function, which in the same phase, okay. And uh, so those, uh, those models are soluble. There's a commuting projector uh, model to solve this. So yeah. if a topological order has a gap at the boundary, there's commuting projector uh, realization. So, so indeed, they are very different, and uh, but however, uh, they have a physical uh, connection here. Okay, thank you. Maybe uh, one or two more questions. Uh, oh yeah, Xiao Gang. Yeah, can can yeah. I ask one more question? So sure. you, you started uh, uh, from you know, considering Hamiltonian and equivalent classes of Hamiltonian, and. Uh, yeah, in the end, there are the S and T and those beautiful steps. So uh, my question is the following. So from the latest Hamiltonian point of view, sometimes we can have a, a, 
a system described by a Hamiltonian, which uh, locally looks like a certain topological that let's say the Tori code. Yeah. But uh, the ground state degeneracy may be different from whole. So it's different from the anion types. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sure you, you know some of the models, they, they can be written as a commuting projector. Okay. Yeah. So my question is, what's your favorite way to describe or understand those models? Oh, yeah. I, I, I believe if the, if, the, if the Hamiltonian can be written as a commuting projector, it means that their boundary can be gapped. There's a gapped boundary. Yeah. And their boundary can be described by a certain fusion category. And then you can understand this uh, commuting project Hamiltonian and the Gronk's wave function using the fusion category, using fusion category to construct wave function and understand all that. So I, I see that, 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 that is the way. However, if the boundary is uh, always gapless, there's no gap in the boundary, then this would become a difficult question. Yeah, the diffi the difficult mm -hmm. problem. Yeah, we, we, do, we don't have a soluble model to, to, to describe them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe let, let's just talk about the Tori code. So uh, locally on, on every disk, yeah, let's put the system on the torus. Uh, on every yeah. disk, the model looks, uh, has no different from the Tori code. There's a four anion types, uh, however, uh, yeah, we can construct a model such that the ground state degeneracy on torus is two-fold instead of four, four-fold. So what's the... Oh, uh, no, that is why I have a twist boundary condition. Yeah, uh, yeah. The reason is that uh, in that, uh, that, that one have a so-called not allowed boundary condition because around mm -hmm. the, going around the, the torus, uh, the, the uh, two type of particle get exchanged, E and M get exchanged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so those are, uh, uh, yeah, th those are uh, yeah, th those are interesting things. I don't know what what kind of mathematics correspond mm -hmm. to. That okay. is a uh, uh, when you define a tabular quantum field theory, when you go around the space, the anion type may may get uh, permuted. Yeah, and this kind of boundary condition uh, will give rise to a uh, uh, different uh, ground state degeneracy. The ground state is no longer given by the particle type, anion mm -hmm. type. Yeah. And uh, so I think this is uh, okay. Yeah, this is a, uh, uh, this is a, uh, yeah, this is kind of a known in a sense. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, for, first this is a kind of physically relevant, right? Because the degeneracy is still protected <laughs> even we add perturbations. No, that's not, that's not perturbation. That's a totally different boundary condition. It's not a perturbation. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you, you, have, you, have, you have a different <laughs> boundary condition. That's a large change. Yeah. Uh, what I mean is, we can start from a Hamiltonian with that boundary condition and add perturbations. Then the two-fold degeneracy is. It's a still robust. That's still robust. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so so you are seeing there. So it's not not uh, the the phenomena is a uh, well known. Which it's well known. The 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 point is that the correspondence between degeneracy and the particle type have an assumption which, are, which is a particle type do not permute when you go around the space. Mm -hmm. uh, when particle types start to permute, uh, the correspondence is more complicated. Uh, and, uh, yeah, there, there's no correspondence, uh, there's no direct correspondence. Mm. But, but there, there is some relation, right? Like, for example, suppose I know that locally it looks like a terror code. This fact will constrain the possible twisted boundary condition. There, there should be some relation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For for each topology order, uh, we have a, if a category have an automorphism, then you can you can assign you can define this twist boundary condition, and this twist boundary condition can be used as to, as a way to measure uh, to measure a topology order. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, this is a very good point. Yeah. So so my question is uh, maybe what, is there a universal framework? Maybe a generalization of modular tensor category? Yeah, I think so. Basically, as I mentioned, for every automorphism you have, you can you can do this per, per, permute anion, and you can uh, compute this uh, degeneracy of ground states. Mm. And uh, I, I don't know the answer, but this is a good calculation to do. <laughs> That's a more way to more way to to mm. to detect topological order. Mm. 